Within days after the outside article went to press, I discovered that a few of the details I'd reported were an error. Most were minor inaccuracies of the sort that inevitably creep into works of deadline journalism. But one of my blunders was in no sense minor, and it had a devastating impact on the friends and family of one of the victims. Only slightly less disconcerting than the article's factual errors was the material that necessarily had to be omitted for lack of space. Mark Bryant, the editor of Outside, and Larry Burke, the publisher, had given me an extraordinary amount of room to tell the story. They ran the piece at 17,000 words, four or five times as long as a typical magazine feature. Even so, I felt that it was much too abbreviated to do justice to the tragedy. The Everest climb had rocked my life to its core, and it became desperately important for me to record the events in complete detail, unconstrained by a limited number of column inches. This book is the fruit of that compulsion. The staggering unreliability of the human mind at high altitude made the research problematic. To avoid relying excessively on my own perceptions, I interviewed most of the protagonists at great length and on multiple occasions. When possible, I also corroborated details with radio logs maintained by people at base camp, where clear thought wasn't in such short supply. Readers familiar with the outside article may notice discrepancies between certain details, primarily matters of time, reported in the magazine and those reported in the book. The revisions reflect new information that has come to light since publication of the magazine piece. Several authors and editors I respect counseled me not to write the book as quickly as I did. They urged me to wait two or three years and put some distance between me and the expedition in order to gain some crucial perspective. Their advice was sound, but in the end I ignored it, mostly because what happened on the mountain was gnawing my guts out. I thought that writing the book might purge Everest from my life. It hasn't, of course. Moreover, I agree that readers are often poorly served when an author writes as an act of catharsis, as I have done here. But I hoped something would be gained by spilling my soul in the calamity's immediate aftermath, in the royal and torment of the moment. I wanted my account to have a raw, ruthless sort of honesty that seemed in danger of leeching away with the passage of time and the dissipation of anguish. Some of the same people who warned me against writing hastily had also cautioned me against going to Everest in the first place. There were many, many fine reasons not to go, but attempting to climb Everest is an intrinsically irrational act, a triumph of desire over sensibility. Any person who would seriously consider it is almost by definition beyond the sway of reasoned argument. The plain truth is that I knew better, but went to Everest anyway. And in doing so, I was a party to the death of good people, which is something that is apt to remain on my conscience for a very long time. John Krakauer, Seattle, November 1996